Good evening, you're watching Estrue News. Coming up, we find out about the church organ that needs some tender loving care. And we find out a little more about the new memorial for Chorleman in Hull. We visit the area deemed one of the best bird watching spots in Europe. And we discover how the staff at the deep keep track of all their fish. <laughs> Bird watching is a hobby enjoyed by millions of nature lovers around the world, but one of the best places to see birds in Europe is right on our doorstep. Last year, the Humber Estuary was in the list of the top 10 bird watching sites in Europe, and with birds migrating for the winter, we went to find out why. If you're the type of person who enjoys bird watching, then you're in luck this winter. Late last year, the Humber Estuary was named as one of the top 10 spots in Europe to go bird watching and one of the top five places in the UK to see birds. The number of migratory birds settling in the area for the winter is being cited as the reason for the rich wildlife. Uh, absolutely right, but it's winter and over, uh, migratory overwintering birds. Uh, you look at it now, it's fairly sparse uh, for birds, but they should be arriving within the next month or two. Yeah, well, it's, it's the biggest estuary on the east coast, uh, and we've got loads of mudflats which uh, gives them ba uh, bags of food, and that's why they come on visitors. The grassy areas on the banks provide great nesting spots, and the mud dunes provide a wide array of food sources. Yeah, it, it's the food supply we've got here. We've got some massive mud flats, and that's what they're coming for, for all the, uh, what they call ethnic community. But it's all the shellfish, uh, worms and grubs that are living within the mud that the birds come for. And then there is a huge range of unique birds that settle for the winter, ranging from the more common sites to the more rare sites that are rarely seen on the estuary. Uh, well, the, you'll see the big clouds of uh, uh, sweeping over the estuary. They're usually dunlin or not. Uh, then we've got the curlews, oyster catchers, shell duck. Uh, if calling at the Discovery Centre, we've just put a load of birds up on the displays, uh, showing you the different birds you will see in there. The, the most recent ones we've got coming in, uh, and we've seen quite a lot of them now, and that's the uh, little creeps. They're, they're, they've started to make an appearance on the estuary, uh, whereas one time you never used to see them. Unfortunately, it seems a lot of people don't know how rich for bird life the Humber Estuary is. And now, with the help from the Lincolnshire Wildlife Partnership, the aim is to persuade more people to come and see the varieties of bird life that settle on the Humber. No, it's one of our secrets. We keep it to ourselves and we should be jumping up and down, shouting how good it is. It's a fantastic green tourist attraction. Uh, 130,000 birds at any one time. It's well worth visiting. We are working with the Greater Lincolnshire Nature Partnership, doing a survey at the moment as how the whole of the east coast uh, of Lincolnshire can be uh, promoted for its green tourism. We've got the seals, they'll be starting in another couple of months. And then we've got the birds as well, which are absolutely fantastic to come and see. The Humber economy was built on the shipping and the fishing industries, and many lives were lost at sea in the line of work. Since 2003, the Hull-based charity Stand has been campaigning for a permanent memorial, and after a competition, they've picked a winner, as Dave Nunn went to find out. The Humber is an industrialised area that owes many of its current fortunes to the fishing and trawler industries. St Andrew's Quay in Hull is set to become home to a brand new memorial commemorating trawlermen that have died in the line of work. Peter Naylor's sculpture of these trawlermen and a child stood in front of a bell won a competition. He explained how he came up with the image. Um, there's 13 men, they're going to stand about 9 feet high. Um, I, I could have made them higher. I, I want them within that kind of human scale. I want people to bond with them. Uh, 13 men because deliberately the, I want them to be unlucky in that sense. These are obviously it's for the 6,000 fishermen that died in Hull in the last 100 years. Um, it's not obvious there are 13. It's only if you started counting them. But in that sense, they are inextricably ill-fated, really. So I, I think that's quite a nice little touch. I, I hope... It, in many ways, it's a very obviously it's a very serious subject, and it, it can get a little bit macabre. I've tried to lighten it. In front of them, there's a, a small figure, a kind of eight, nine-year-old boy carrying a, a heavy suitcase on his head, and he's smiling. 
Uh, and I hope he's just a little sort of, t almost a touch of humour that will just warm it slightly. Round him, we're going to embed uh, pre decimalisation coins because the uh, trollermen used to empty their pockets of coins before getting on board. That was another superstition. Stand is a whole based charity that's been campaigning and planning for a permanent memorial to trollermen since 2003. With the seas playing such an important part in local economic history, the chairman of Stand, Ron Wilkinson, says this permanent memorial is more than needed. Marlborough City have lost more than 6,000 men over a period of time. There's not many cities throughout the country that claim to have that amount of fatalities in a normal job. Because at the end of the day, it was a normal job. These guys went to sea, they carried out their, their work as normal. They didn't see uh, the, the dangers that were there. They knew they existed, but they just went and did the job. And to lose 6,000 men like that, it's a crime that we have a memorial to commemorate them. Peter says being involved with the project is an absolute honour, and his many connections to the industry and the people in it have made it a poignant project for him to be involved with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is it's an integral part of Hull's history and Hull's character. Um, Although the fishing finished quite a while ago, I mean, you, everybody in Hull, you only have to take one step sideways with them and they're connected to somebody that had a link to the fishing industry. My own father started his working life on, on the fish dock. I started my teaching career on, in Kingston High School on Pickering Road, teaching the children of, of the fishermen. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a complete, this building we're in now, you can look at the whaling uh, skeletons, they're fastened to the ceilings by fittings that my grandfather made because he was a blacksmith that worked for Hull Council. So, you know, I mean, everybody in Hull is so closely linked to the, it is a maritime city. If you have any news or sports stories for us, or you'd like to appear on our news sofa you can get in touch with us uh, by emailing news at estuary.tv or by calling us on 01472 31553. As Hull's year as city of culture looms into view, Holy Trinity Church is being ready to be a focal point of the action. Work has begun on the outside of the church which you might not know is the largest parish church in the country but there's an integral part of the interior of the building that also needs some care. Dan Kemp pulls out all the stops. The organ, a staple of church life. It provides the backdrop to weddings, funerals and christenings. But what do people know about the instrument itself? Well, Holy Trinity Church has given us a look behind the scenes as they look to fundraise for its refurbishment. One of the views that people don't get to see about organs is, is you know, what it really looks like. You can hear them, you'll see the front of an organ very often in a church, but that's it, so how does it work? And it works with air rushing through pipes, like uh, recorders or trumpets or whatever. And really what we have here, we've got four keyboards, and we've got a pedal board for your feet, which is a keyboard for your feet, and, um, and this helps us to um, play an orchestra of all different sorts of instruments, all powered by wind. So, for example, like flutes, if I can put a flute on there. Or if we want a high-pitched flute, and uh, we can find one here. But it's not just the keyboard console and the pipes for the air to whistle through them. It takes a lot more than that. It's a very complicated machine. You can imagine though, it's not full of computers, it's not like a, an electrical keyboard that you would press nowadays and you just get a note through a speaker. Everything is physical and everything is hand built. So after 80 years, all the wind pipes that uh, channel wind from one place to another to allow it to operate, lots of leaks in those now. The bellows, which are absolutely enormous things, the wind reservoirs, all the leather work on that is, is, is very much perished these, uh, these days. You imagine a pair of leather shoes lasting, how, how long does a pair of leather shoes last? You know, um, not very long. This leather work is 80 years old, some of it's over 100 years old. And there's a lot of it. Uh, the, all the electrical systems that allow me to press a key, there we go, if I press that key, actually, that's a switch. It's open, it's going to a set of relays 
over 30 feet away. Those relays then send a message over 50 feet into the organ itself, which is up there and, and up here, and open valves and let the air through the pipes. And all of those systems, after 80 years or so, are now needing some attention. They need cleaning, they need taking apart and um, readjusting. Some of them will need repair and so on. So I'm sure you'll agree, a truly versatile instrument, but there's a serious side. It's already incapable of performing to its fullest and it's not been refurbished since the 1930s and Mark believes it could be an expensive job to restore to its former glory as they look to begin works on the organ by first funding investigation work. But how much could the full refurb set the church back? could cost anything between 400000 and uh, a million to do entirely. Now, to do that all in one go, you know, that's not realistic. So what we're looking at is doing it in, in achievable stages. Join me again after the break as we find out how the staff at the deep carry out their task of counting all the fish. And we ask people in Grimsby how they feel about the government's new alcohol guidance. And Dan Kemp will bring us some of the regional headlines and the latest sports news. Welcome back, you're watching SG News. Coming up, we ask the people of Grimsby what they think of the government's new alcohol guidance. People who go to the deep can see thousands of animals on display in the attraction, ranging from penguins to insects and quite a lot of fish in between. Every year, the staff there carry out an annual census to keep track of how many beasties they've got on the premises and in which tanks they live. Dave Nunn went to find out how they undertake this monumental task. The Deep is one of our area's largest visitor attractions and features many different kinds of animals across hundreds of different displays. Over the last week, staff at the attraction have been undertaking the monumental task of conducting a census of all the animals. OK, well, we're just about three quarters of the way through our annual census. Uh, that means that uh, the husbandry department takes time out of its normal day job of looking after the animals to count every individual animal. That means we go around each display so that we know accurately exactly how many animals are in our care. The Deep is home to over 3,500 fish and has numerous other animals, ranging from their new penguins to smaller insects. Last year the staff counted over 5,000 total animals which are from around 300 different species. You'd think that this was all done electronically, but while the data is stored on a computer system, the counting of every animal in every display is done by hand. When you count things, you count things by hand, one, two, three, four. Um, we do have a very fancy electronic system where because we know how many animals have gone into our displays, we know accurately how many are there um, and we know, if, say for example, if they move on to another aquarium or move around the building, we know exactly where they've gone because physically we've moved them from one to another to another. But having said that, it's still very important that you do do that manual count each year. The task of counting the animals sounds like a daunting one. Some of the fish and insects are nearly microscopic in size, which makes counting them extremely difficult. Meanwhile, some of the exhibitions, like the Endless Ocean exhibit, are huge tanks that cover several floors, so there are unique challenges involved. It can be a little bit of a challenge uh, on some of our larger displays where there's lots and lots of species, um, they're all the same and there's a high number of them, like for example in this tank behind me uh, we have Trevally Jack, uh, the horse high species, we have over 80 of them, so they never stop swimming so it can be a little bit of a challenge to count them. We've tried lots of different methods over the years, one from having lots of people at individual windows with a clicker and they count, we've tried taking the photo and counting off the photo, so for that reason um, it's very important that you try to get as accurate as possible. Um, I would obviously, with having detailed records, means that you know exactly what's there. Even if it is a logistical challenge, it has to be done. It is a legal requirement of having a zoo licence. Um, well, this is part of our zoo licence. Um, it's important that we keep accurate records of the animals that we keep in our care. Um, and that's, the zoo licence is set out by the Secretary of State's uh, Modern Practice for Zoo Standards. And we have to adhere to that very closely. One of the very clear points is you have to have accurate records so you know exactly how many animals are in your displays. 
Last week, the UK's chief medical officer changed guidance on how much alcohol we should drink. The changes suggest that men should drink no more than 14 units a week, and new advice says that no amount of alcohol is healthy for you. We went to the streets of Grimsby to ask what they think, though I think I can guess. I'm only 18, that's what happened. They all go, oh, mad night, mad night, and it's like, no, just take, take it easy, go out for a nice meal, make sure you... But, no, I mean, the units, no one's going to listen to. At the end of the day, they're there because I have to be for law. But apart from that, it should really, you know, everyone's the free will. Well, they have a say on too much. Uh, it's, it's everything they have a say on, so it's no difference, you know, what it is. They'll be telling you what time to go to bed next. <laughs> it's each to their own. should know their, in, their own intake. So it's not down to the government to tell us. Who can, who can drink what and who can't drink what? Well, I really, I suppose it's up to people, but it's handy to know what you should have, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You've got a guideline then, haven't you? But some people will drink, no matter what you say, won't they? Uh, new guidelines uh, come out quite frequently. Uh, they're probably right. They're, broadly speaking, it's probably a good idea not to, to, um, not to, um, not to drink too much and, and not to overindulge in, in, in alcohol. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just common sense, really. People are confused by different... different uh, you know, different doctors saying something, the paper saying something. I think we need a proper guideline. Um, so I'd say one time they say that red wine's good for you, and then the next thing they say it's bad for you, and now they're saying one pint is all you need to take. And so people are so totally confused, and they're just going to ignore it. I don't think it'll make the slightest difference if people want to drink their drink, won't they? And it, I don't think it'll make any difference at all. I want to see Grimsby put on the map extraordinary qualities unmatched in anywhere else in Britain. We need to act with one voice. I was absolutely shocked, I'll tell you the truth. More police officer hours spent on patrol preventing crimes from happening. And uh, now Dan Kemp is here to bring us some of the regional headlines. Dan, what have you got? Good evening, Thank you. Um, the first story, this is that White College in Hull this morning about 8 o'clock was evacuated. Um, students from the college have spoken of a scary moment they were told to get out of the building amid a security threat. At the minute we don't know exactly what it was, but we understand it was an email containing um, I suppose, threats towards members of staff and pupils. And it happened, as I said, about 8 o'clock this morning and school buses were turned back and children were sent pretty swiftly back to where they came from. Well, that's an unhappy way to get a day off school, isn't it? And it I think is. some other establishments had similar emails around, the, in fact, around the world. Uh, it's just a proof of how easy it is to disrupt everybody's life just by sending a, a hoax it email, exactly. isn't it? Obviously, I'm sure, to some teenagers, and if I was at school, on my way to school, I'd be obviously fairly excited to get the day off, but obviously there's a very serious message behind it that threats are obviously spreading and getting to people in different ways. So yep. it's something that... All too People easily done. need to be more and more uh, aware of. At the press of a button. Yes. The next story, this is also in the Hull Daily Mail. This is that Hull's three Labour MPs have come together, really, to um, try and get the Amy Johnson's Gypsy Moth aeroplane back into Hull in time for next year's City of Culture celebrations. Where is it now? It's in the Science Museum in London at the moment. And well, they've that's better than it being in Australia, I suppose, but we want it well, back. it has been there, obviously, at one point. Um, yeah, we want it back. We want it in Hull for, for next year. Diana Johnson is the cons is the member of parliament for where Amy Johnson was born. North Hull, she, yep. She's led the campaign. Alan Johnson and um, Carl Turner, the two other MPs, have signed off as well to try and um, put their weight behind it. Excellent. She's our aviator, and we want we want our plane back. We want her back. Thank you very much. We don't much. want her back. We want the plane back. W what's next? <laughs> the next story. This is a bit of a sports story um, in the Grimsby Telegraph, and this is that. Patrick Very. Amund is um, up there amongst the uh, top strikers in Europe. Excellent, thank you. Dan, I, I believe you have some sports news for us I do. Well. we'll start off with some uh, Hull City news there. Our manager Steve Bruce has admitted interest in former Arsenal striker Nicholas Bentner, but says he hasn't made any inquiries for the player. The Danish international currently plays for Wolfsburg in the German Bundesliga. And here's what Bruce had to say on the link in this morning's weekly press conference. I've had Nicholas twice. Um, I don't know if he is available. I think people are assuming things. I mean, if he did become available, then I would certainly be interested. But at this particular moment, I don't think he is. Certainly, we wouldn't be in a position to buy Nicholas. And certainly, I would think in the Bundesliga, he'd probably be on too big a salary for us to even think about it. But somebody that I've always liked as a player, I've had him twice before, 
Um, so if he was available and he, he can come for a tenner a week or whatever, then we'll be interested. Meanwhile, Bruce has today dismissed any talk of fullback Andy Robertson making a £7 million switch to Derby, as has been speculated. I don't know where that's come from and would I really contemplate selling to Derby? I don't think so. You know, but uh, he's a smashing young player who's still learning his trade. Um, but I can't see us wanting to sell one of our better players to, to Derby. So I can certainly quash that one. Even if they got to double that figure, I don't think we'd be selling. So why would we want to break anything up now? So we want to try and improve the squad if we can, not obviously dismantle it. And elsewhere with the Tigers, under-21 captain Matty Dixon has today completed a permanent move to League Two club at York City. Grimsby Town boss Paul Hurst admits he knows very little about tomorrow's FA Trophy opponents, Western Supermare. The Mariners only found out their opponents on Wednesday evening, following several postponements between Western Supermare and Wealdstone in round one. There's a lot of names there that uh, haven't come across in, in the past, so it's a little bit of an unknown and, and more than usual. Uh, but while you know the research will take place between now and, and the weekend, a lot of it, as always, is about ourselves. And like I said, no disrespect to his opposition, but I believe that if we, we're right um, and play anywhere near what I know we're capable of, then we'll have a good chance of progressing. So the fixtures in full for the weekend. Hull City hosts Charlton Athletic tomorrow in the Championship. Scunthorpe United travel to Bloomfield Road to take on struggling Blackpool. Grimsby Town are home to Western Supermare in the FA Trophy. North Ferriby United are at Hennesford and Gainsborough Trinity host Telford United both those in National League North. Hull FC continued their preparations for the 2016 Super League season with a training game against championship outfit Bradford Bulls. With the new campaign just over three weeks away, Bradford visited the Black and White County Road training ground. Lee Radford's Hull FC side faced Doncaster in their first official friendly this Sunday before taking on Hull KR in the Clive Sullivan Trophy a week later. And finally, in Rugby Union, we have a trio of away fixtures this week. Hull Ionians are at Rosslyn Park, Hull IUFC play Ilkley, and Scunthorpe travel to Newport. And Hugh, that's all for the sport. Thank you very much, Dan, and that's all for tonight, I'm afraid. If you have a news story, then please visit our Facebook or Twitter pages, email news at s3.tv or phone Grimsby 01472 Until next week, good evening. Estuary TV Weather, sponsored by Rick's Petroleum, your local family-owned heating oil supplier this winter. Hello and welcome to Estuary TV's weather. A frosty start for Saturday, but some sunny spells emerging with scattered snow showers. Highs of 2 degrees. Sunday will be sunny with overnight frosts. Servicing the region's oil boilers this winter from a name you can trust. Get in touch at ricks.co.uk or call us on 01482 838383.